Hi, everybody. This is Blaine DeSantis. I welcome you to another edition of Books and Looks. Yes, it's our weekly voyage of discovery in the wonderful world of books. Books that I've been reading and authors that I've been interviewing. And today we are joined by Marguerite Fox, one of the best nonfiction writers out there. She's talking to us about her new historical book. It's called The Talented Mrs. Mandelbaum. That's right. The Talented Mrs. Mandelbaum. What a great book. It's about the rise and fall of an American organized crime boss. And her name is Mrs. That's right. It's a woman in the 1860s through the 1880s. Yes, Mrs. Mandelbaum amassed a criminal enterprise that is out of this world. I'll tell you what, I learned so much about crime. I learned so much about this lady, this immigrant Jewish German woman who came to America with nothing in her pockets and rose to the top of the crime world. She didn't kill people or do anything violent. No, all she was a fence. She, you got something, you stole, you went to Mrs. Mandelbaum. She then had somebody, she passed it on to somebody else at a profit, of course. Anyway, it is a wonderful book. It's a wonderful look at that era of time. And Marguerite Fox is an awfully fine author. You know, before she did this, and we didn't get into this because it isn't relevant, but before this, Marguerite was the obituary writer for the New York Times. Yeah, she wrote over 1,400 obituaries for the New York Times. This wonderful writer has now doing nonfiction books, and you're going to really love the talented Mrs. Mandelbaum. So I'm going to go right to my interview with Marguerite. Hello, Marguerite. How are you doing? I'm well, Blaine. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very happy to have you. And friends, I don't need to show you the book because right behind her, you'll see the name of the book, The Talented Mrs. Mandelbaum. Five-star rating, folks. Five-star rating for me. What a great book. Marguerite, you did a great job with this book. Uh, so happy I could have you on. Oh, thank you. You're my new best friend. Five <laughs> stars. What's to complain about? Can't complain about that. Nope. Tell us a little bit about your background. Though. Not much, but it's a little bit. Where you grew up, where did you go to college, and, and you started in journalism, if I'm not mistaken. Tell us just a little bit. Sure thing. I am a Long Island girl, born and bred. My father was a professor of physics at the State University of New York at Stony Brook, which is on the north shore of Long Island, about 60 miles east of New York City. So I grew up there, and my first two degrees, a bachelor's and a master's degree in linguistics, are from Stony Brook. Uh, when I was about 30, I was living in New York City, went back to school at Columbia for a master's in journalism, and I have been a journalist and now nonfiction author ever since. Wow. Well, that's a pretty big a career jump, isn't it? From journalism into nonfiction writing. Um, did you always want to write nonfiction? I did. Unfortunately, I was born without the fiction gene. And it's not that novelists don't do lots of research, but they can at least have the luxury of making things up when needed. Uh, of course, I, as a nonfiction person, cannot do that. We have to be beholden to the facts. But to get to your point, there's really no disjunction between daily journalism and nonfiction book writing. It's simply a question of scale, because if you take a nonfiction newspaper story, well, newspaper stories are, of course, all nonfiction, and let's say it's a thousand words, and again, the reporter is beholden to the truth, the newspaper story answers the essential question what happened, you take that and grid it up, let's say, a hundred times, then you have a hundred thousand word nonfiction book that also, at greater length, answers the question, what happened? Well, you certainly do that in all your books. And, you know, and that's one of the things that I, I meant to, to ask you. Uh, you seem to like to concentrate, or your books have all been on uh, events around a hundred years or more ago. Do you like that time period in particular? I do. Uh, there's also the seduction for a nonfiction writer of working in an area where all of the documents and all of the pictures are in the public domain. Uh, because otherwise, like a filmmaker putting aside end money for post-production, otherwise you have to put aside a lot of end money to pay for rights to pictures, certain quoted material, 
And so on a purely pragmatic level, it's nice to work in an older area than that so that intellectual property is not an economic drain. Uh, But also, I love these stories that have kind of slipped into a crevice in history. And for me, part of the fascination and the joy of writing a nonfiction book that's set in the early 20th century or the 19th century, as Mrs. Mandelbaum is, the real pleasure comes from getting to lever the story out of that crevice and take a look at it from our 21st century perspective. Well, now, we talk about Mrs. Mandelbaum. How did you find her? Where did you find Mrs. Mandelbaum? Well, how I found her is kind of a textbook cautionary tale in writing historical nonfiction. Whenever I'm looking around for a new project, the first place I turn to are the shelves of my own library, where I have many, many long out of print, dusty volumes, dusty anthologies about all manner of historical curiosities. And so a few years ago, when my previous book, The Confidence Men, had gone into production at Random House, I was casting about for something to do. I took down from my shelves a thick volume that was an encyclopedia of crime. And for reasons that will become obvious, I won't name the book or the compiler, but it opened, as if by magic, to a tantalizing entry. The entry was headed Grand Street School. Now, Grand Street is a street still extant on New York's Lower East Side. The entry said that in the mid-19th century, there was an actual brick and mortar school run by this lady crime boss named Friedrika Mandelbaum, in which aspiring American Oliver Twists, aspiring young criminals, could go and attend classes in the arts of pickpocketing and housebreaking, safe cracking, all that stuff. Now, the compiler of this really should have seen that red flag. Classic case of when a story looks too good to be true, it probably ain't true. And indeed, a minute or two of online research told me right away that the Grand Street School was an urban legend that arose in the 19th century and endures, regrettably, to this day. So that was a wash. However, Friedrika Mandelbaum, the woman who supposedly ran this school, was very, very real. And indeed, she was the first major organized crime boss in America, this nice Jewish mother of four. That's amazing. And so when you saw that, you could sort of tell that I got to write that. Absolutely. I love stories that throw into a kind of pleasurable chaos our preconceived notions. If you asked any American, if I say the words organized crime boss, what do you picture? And younger people will picture Tony Soprano. Older people might picture the actor Bruce Gordon playing Frank Nitty on The Untouchables. You know, a big, strapping, nasty guy with spats and pinstripes and a machine gun during Prohibition. That was true in the 20s and 30s. And yet, in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s, the most notorious, the most successful, and the most enduring organized crime boss in America was this big lady named Frederica Mandelbaum, who had come here in steerage with the clothes on her back in 1850, started in tenement poverty on the Lower East Side, and within a decade or two had risen to become one of the wealthiest criminals, most likely one of the wealthiest women in America. Wow. Somewhere in the book, she is compared to a dumpling and a mountain. And I love whoever wrote that. That's a classic. <laughs> well, thank you. I wrote that. Uh, <laughs> oh, I didn't know if that was a quote from another, from another source. Heaven for Fent. No, that's not a quote. That's me. Frederica oh, Mandelbaum was, in any era, would have been a dominating physical presence. And in the 19th century, when people were not as big as they are now, must have absolutely loomed over New York, which certainly didn't do her any harm as 
an imposing figure of a crime boss. She was reported to be about six feet tall and to weigh 250 to 300 pounds, but she was kind of pouchy. She was this big, billowy, zoftic Jewish mother. I picture the actress Gertrude Berg, who played the mother in the original TV show, The Goldbergs. Uh, So I say she looked like the product of a congenial liaison between a dumpling and a mountain. Well, I think that's a perfect, uh, perfect description of her. And it also, you know, it makes her rather while she stands out, it also makes her, you know, people don't believe this little this big woman could be possibly doing what she does. It made it a little bit unbelievable. Right. She was kind of a pillar of her community when she acquired wealth. She became a generous benefactor to her synagogue on the Lower East Side. She was a generous benefactor to her neighbors. She was still living uh, to the end of her life in America, though she became rich enough to live anywhere in town. She chose to remain in the immigrant enclave on the Lower East Side, known as Klein Deutschland. Little Germany. It was one of the country's first important immigrant communities, and immigrants like her, Jews and Gentiles, could pass their days speaking nothing but German, drinking and dancing in German beer halls, seeing German folk parades, and those were her people. She never left the community. She was a great benefactor to other members of the community who were much less well off than she. She maintained a modest haberdashery shop on the corner of Clinton and Rivington Streets in that Lower East Side pocket. That was the front for her real business, which was carried on in a warren of secret back rooms. And then upstairs, for she eventually bought the whole building, she raised her four children in baronial splendor with cut glass chandeliers and all oil paintings in gold frames and lush carpets, velvet draperies, the finest china and crystal, a wine cellar, a staff of servants. As I say, it was like a New World Palace of Versailles upstairs on this unremarkable corner of the Lower East Side. <laughs> that's that's really something else. I, I'll tell you what, that that's amazing what she did there. And uh... You know, but was there anybody else at that time period who was as broad in scope as Mrs. Mandelbaum was in terms of their, the crime uh, that she organized? There were certainly plenty of other criminals. Uh, you know, obviously, as long as there has been mankind, there's been crime. Um, I was not able to find anyone in the course of a couple of years of research whose empire was as extensive. Friedrich Mandelbaum, who started life as a peddler selling lace door-to-door, eventually realized that the way to go was to climb the so-called crooked ladder. It's vital to remember that she didn't set out to be a criminal, but when you come to America as a threadbare female Jewish immigrant and you try to make it in polite society— in the world of legitimate commerce, of course, door after door is slammed in your face and you discover you are disenfranchised from legitimate business and from polite society three times over. You're an immigrant, you're a woman, you're a Jew. And needless to say, xenophobia, misogyny, and anti-Semitism are nothing new. They were very much alive and well in the mid-19th century when Mrs. Mandelbaum came here. So what do you do? There is this crooked ladder, a way of ascending through the underworld to provide for yourself and assure a good future for your children, make sure they're fed and clothed and well-educated. Now, men who chose to do that had many choices. They could run numbers parlors, gambling operations, be hired muscle, be, um, you know, one of the thugs hired by Tammany Hall to get the vote out. But women, just as in the upper world, the world of legitimate enterprise, they were equally marginalized in the underworld. And when Frederica came here, the only two choices for women who, for whatever reason, sought an underworld career were shoplifting and prostitution. Well, the one 
didn't pay well, and the other was deeply dangerous. There's a devastating statistic from Mrs. Mandelbaum's time that if a woman in New York entered prostitution, she could expect to live, on average, only another four years. So those were out of the question. So she knew the way forward was to amass capital. So she not only climbed the crooked ladder, she had to build the ladder first. And the way she did that was by becoming a receiver and reseller of stolen property, a fence in colloquial terms. And she gradually built up a cohort of foot soldiers, men and women, shoplifters, housebreakers, jewel thieves, and eventually bank burglars, not only in New York, but in cities all across America. So to get back to your question, I am not aware of anyone who had the ge sustained geographic reach or the longevity over 25 years that this woman did. Wow. One of the fascinating parts in, in your book is you point out that while uh, Frederica was building her empire and ran this empire, her husband was still, I think, a, a peddler, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. In the old country, in what is now central Germany, uh, Friedrich Mandelbaum, who grew up in a poor village Jewish family, her people had been peddlers, one of the few trades that Jews were allowed to ply in the restrictive anti-Semitic conditions that often obtained in the old country. And when she was 23 and they were still there, she married Wolf Mandelbaum, who was himself a peddler. They came to America when Frederica was 25 with their infant daughter, Bertha. One of the most devastating things about their story is that amid the tenement poverty in which they spent their first few years with you know, families crammed together in dilapidated buildings, no running water, backyard outhouses that everyone used that weren't hooked up to any sewage system. So raw sewage festering in backyards, uh, bands of roaming pigs, snapping at garbage in the street. Needless to say, communicable diseases like typhoid and cholera consumption were rampant. And among those diseases, their baby daughter died. And so you can imagine, we don't know, Frederica was smart enough to leave no personal papers, but you can imagine any mother thinking, never again will this happen. I have to find a way to provide for the family in the future. Her husband, Wolf, indeed continued as a peddler. He seemed largely oblivious of Frederica's ascent in the underworld. There's a wonderful quote from a man with the wonderful name of George Washington Walling, who was New York's chief of police during much of Frederica's rise. And he said, and the quote is so great, it's burned into my memory. He said, the woman took the lead in these nefarious transactions. She was a thorough businesswoman. Her husband was a non-entity, as we would say in Yiddish, a nebish. And uh, it's pretty clear that the don't ask, don't tell relationship that you have to have with the thieves working for you, with your customers, with members of the public, with the, the media, when you're in her line of work, it's pretty clear that that extended to her marriage as well. In any case, Wolf Mandelbaum died in 1875, most likely of consumption. And so from then on, Friedrika was a widow. She had four children by this time. And so to whatever extent his peddling had contributed to the family income, that revenue stream was gone. So she was now sole support of her family. One of the things that you bring up, and it really, it really hit home with me, was that she used the same methods. Maybe she developed them that efficiency experts used, that the robber barons used to get ahead. But... It, you know, it was a woman and it was crime. They didn't like her doing that. Could you say, what are some of the things that she did uh, to, to continue and expand her enterprise? Friedrich Mandelbaum, and obviously she'd never been to university. She certainly hadn't been to business school, but she had a genius for being able to look at 
the culture of New York City and American society more generally, and see that they're because of the later years of the Industrial Revolution, urbanization, and there was this growing middle class, and the middle class was being taught by newspapers and magazines to crave the flood of household goods and these newly mass-produced consumer products that were starting to flood the market in the later half of the 19th century. But of course, they didn't want to pay full price for all of these things. The housewife was under great pressure, bourgeois housewife, to load her parlor up with all kinds of furniture and doilies and drapery and chintz and knick-knack and bric-a-brac. Well, who can, even a middle-class person can't afford all that, nor does she want to pay even full wholesale price. So what you do in that situation is you make a covert nighttime visit to your friendly neighborhood fence. And they, you know, the old uh, show, I can get it for you wholesale, Frederica could get it for you for well below wholesale. And so she knew to build her customer base around this desire that was aflame in the newly emerging middle class. In later years, in the 1860, uh, America, remember, had been on the gold standard. And what fascinated me in my research is learning that until the 1860s, crimes that to us seem commonplace, like bank robbery and safe cracking, were actually relatively rare. Now, why would that be? Think of the difficulty of a man getting into a bank safe and plundering masses and masses of gold. How is he going to haul it away? He's escaping by horse and carriage. How is the horse going to haul it away? It's going to be noisy. He's going to go clattering down the street. Then along comes the Civil War, and with it the Union's urgent need to raise money quickly. And so, for the first time, there became this torrent of fiat money, greenbacks, paper money backed not by gold or silver, but simply by governmental assurance. And of course, safe crackers, bank burglars, counterfeiters went hip, hip, hooray, because they understood immediately that from all of this new, lightweight, whisper quiet, eminently portable paper money, there was a ton of money to be made. And of course, Frederica was attuned to that cultural sea change. And that was when she and her cadre of men started burglarizing banks. Amazing. Now, I got to ask you something because you, you, you taught me, you taught me so much in this book, but there is a difference between a bank robber and a bank burglar. I never knew that. What is the difference? And nor did I know it until I started writing this book, researching the book, because of course we all use bank robbery and bank burglary pretty much interchangeably. We usually say bank robbery. Bank robbery turns out to be a specific crime. It is when a guy with a mask or a bandana over his face goes into the bank during business hours, points the gun at the teller and says, give me all your money. Bank burglary is another animal altogether that is covert, clandestine, not out in the open, not in the daytime. It's after business hours. And that's when rather than using muscle and firearms, you use skill. You get yourself into the bank somehow, and it may be, as Mrs. Mandelbaum's people did, by renting an office on the basement level of the bank and night after night chipping away at the ceiling to get yourself into the floor of the bank vault. And then it requires even more skill and even more finesse to somehow work those tumblers on the safe and get yourself into the bank vault. That's bank burglary, and it was only bank burglary that Mrs. Mandelbaum had her people do. Wow. Well, you know, you talked about that she has this, excuse me, she has this little shop, dry goods shop, and then above it, she has her home. But that's not all she had there. 
What was this was a big bill? What did she have all that she had in there? And how did it assist all the, this criminal enterprise? If you walked in off the street to her shop, it looked like an ordinary, very unprepossessing haberdashery shop. And anyone who either knew what her real business was or didn't could walk in and buy a, a length of lace, a yard of silk, a spool of thread, although the naive customers, I'm sure, were astonished at how deeply discounted everything was, but so much the better. However, behind a wall that was walled off with a heavy oak door that was barred on the far side was the infrastructure of her real business. It was a warren of secret rooms. There was, on the far side of that wall, a hidden parlor where Mrs. Mandelbaum, who was never seen in the shop, would sit day to day and through a barred window with a heavy iron grill on it, would watch the coming and goings in the shop. If she saw a suspicious character enter, or on those very rare occasions when the police were pressured to raid her, I should add as a footnote that in 25 years of operating as a crime lord in New York, she did not spend a day in jail, but very occasionally to make a public point, the police raided her. Mrs. Mandelbaum, sitting in her private parlor, would take any swag that she had on hand, pop it into a secret dumbwaiter that was hidden behind a chimney in the parlor fireplace, and with one pull of the lever, hoist it upstairs and safely out of sight. Now, that wasn't the only room in this warren of secret back rooms. There was a kind of boardroom that served as a place to plan future robberies and also a kind of hiring hall where hopeful burglars sat around waiting for their various assignments. There was basically the this whole back area was the infrastructure of a very well-oiled bail order fulfillment house. There was a storage room where racks of fur coats and silk dresses and bolts of fabric and jewelry sat to wait a little while until the heat was off, and then they would go into another room where staff members packed them into crates and barrels to be shipped to waiting customers around the country. She had an extensive client list of bourgeois people who didn't want to pay a lot for stuff. There was a dormitory with beds and a washstand for visiting thieves from out of town because her network spanned pretty much the whole country. And then my favorite room, and probably the single most important in this infrastructure, was what I call the effacement chamber, where a hand-picked team of German artisans would work to eradicate any identifying marks on silver or jewelry. It's very lucrative to still to it's very lucrative to steal silver or gold watches, but very often they have engravings on the back, usually the owner's name. Well, that's no good. You can't sell that on because it's immediately traceable. However, she would bring it to the effacement chamber, and if the owner's name was inscribed on the back of the watch, these German artisans would get to work and inscribe a beautiful engraved picture over the name, completely obscuring it. And then it was safe to sell the watch on. And the last thing, perhaps the most vital in her line of work, in these back rooms were a series of secret exits. So in case there was a raid, her staff could make quick getaways through the basement, across, and then up into a building next door, which Mrs. Mandelbaum also owned under another name. Wow. <laughs> Just wow. You know, she was never arrested or spent time in jail, but some of her uh, associates did. And she had some rather interesting attorneys who were working for her. Uh, could you tell us just a little bit about them? And then they wrote this book, which is just fascinating. Could you tell us, please? She did indeed. And it should be stressed because many people ask me, you know, how do you feel writing about a criminal criminal? 
Mrs. Mandelbaum's brand of organized crime, I'm happy to say, was almost entirely nonviolent. I'm not excusing her. She was still a career criminal. She had a staff of people who committed crimes at her behest. So, you know, kids, stay in school. Don't try this at home. But she was only interested in property crime. Uh, what she might have euphemistically called it was the redistribution of material goods. She robbed from the rich and gave, or rather resold at deep discount to the new middle class. So, you know, she wasn't having anyone whacked. She didn't carry firearms. She wasn't having her boys kneecap people. That all came later in the Prohibition era organized crime that we know well from film and television when the big boys with their muscle and their machine guns took over. She was only interested in stealing stuff. One of the reasons that a career built on stealing and reselling stuff served her well without a day in jail for 25 years was her remarkable attorneys, the New York firm of Howe and Hummel, William Howe and Abraham Hummel. They were the most famous, most productive, and best compensated attorneys of pretty much the entire New York underworld. They represented robbers and murderers and thieves and prostitutes and madams and swindlers of every description. Uh, In an age when ethical elasticity, let us say, was far from unknown uh, at the New York bar, these people, Howe and Hummel, were off the charts. They would do anything to win acquittals for their clients, and they almost always did. They bribed, they swindled, they suborned perjury, they tampered with judges, they probably tampered with juries. Their courtroom defenses were these theatrically costumed stage spectaculars. Uh, How was, as I say, perhaps the only person in New York who could outdo Mrs. Mandelbaum for the sheer volume of personal jewelry and the sheer expanse of surface area available for its display. He was a big, sphere-shaped guy, blazed into court, wearing a purple suit. Remember, this is in the 1860s, 1870s, covered practically head to toe with diamonds. I think he could have given Liberace a run for his money in our day. And if a defendant, one of their clients, needed a frail, white-haired mother or a tearful bride or a parcel of angelic children, How and Hummel would simply hire actors to play them in court and make sure they cried a lot. If a baby wasn't crying enough in the mother's lap as the husband was on trial for murder, How would sidle up to the gallery and stab the baby with a pin. So. Um, they were, as I say, if Howe and Hummel had not already existed, Damon Runyon would have had to invent them. Now, in the 1880s, after Mrs. Mandelbaum's career in New York had largely run its course, they published a remarkable instruction manual. It's called Danger with a big exclamation point, written by the attorneys Howe and Hummel. And ostensibly, it is a a manual to warn visitors to New York about the perils of the city. And there were a lot of, in the Victorian era, manuals like that that were simultaneously titillating and fear-inducing about these kind of nether regions of New York where you shouldn't go. And How and Humble's book was nominally like that. They were chapters on swindlers and bank burglars and shoplifters and you name it. What the volume really was was a thinly veiled instruction manual to help robbers and criminals of all kinds improve their paydays. Uh, And of course, in the event that that criminal was eventually caught, it was hoped that they would be represented by Howe and Hummel. So it was a great big advertisement for their law firm between hard covers. 
Now, it was published after Mrs. M's heyday, but the techniques that are described, particularly for shoplifting and robbing, robbing jewelry stores, had been well established in the oral tradition of the underworld for generations and were actively used by her foot soldiers for many, many years. One of the things that I, <clears throat> I, I found fascinating was how attitudes changed towards personal property crime and why that happened. And that's, that's very interesting. Could you tell us why, what, what was the cause of that? Right. The culture changed. And when Mrs. Mandelbaum's career started to falter, and the law, for the first time, started to close in on her in the mid-1880s, it was because the culture had changed, both in New York and in America as a whole. When Mrs. Mandelbaum first came in 1850, and for decades afterward, sort of the control of cities, the control of city governments, the control of the police, was largely the domain of these scrappy, working-class immigrants. Irish, the Germans, the Jews, people just off the boat. Tammany Hall was a canonical example of that in her day. By the 1870s, 1880s, the control of city and state governments was becoming increasingly the domain of native-born patrician white men, people who had been educated at Harvard and Princeton and Yale, people who were from bourgeois backgrounds. And in the end, it was all about capital. They suddenly twigged to the fact that criminals like Friedrich Mandelbaum were seriously cutting into profits in industries like banking and textiles and jewelry many of the same industries in which these bourgeois men and their families had made their fortunes. So suddenly, Friedrika Mandelbaum, who had for decades been seen as a, almost a lovable rogue, became a real menace because what she was was a threat to capital. And so for the first time, uh, a new district attorney is appointed in New York in 1884, and he too is from this patrician Ivy League background, and so he makes it his mission to go after Mrs. Mandelbaum in a serious way for the first time in her career. Just so the people understand the scope of all that she had, how many locations, if you even know the final number, did she have to store all this, the items that she had fenced and was in the process of redistributing? But not just your home, I'm assuming. Well, one of the issues for a fence is where do you stash the stolen goods while you're waiting for the heat to die down before you sell them onward? When she first started out, before she had enough money to buy her whole building, once she bought her whole building, that wasn't much of a problem, although she did own a number of other properties in her, and around the city that were kind of de facto Safe, safe houses where stolen goods could also be stashed. But before she was wealthy enough to afford all that real estate, she was so smart. She became this kind of enterprising good neighbor of the Klein Deutschland community where she would pay the monthly rent on local families' apartments in exchange for being allowed to use a room or two to stash her swag in. So everybody benefited. And she was a beloved figure in her neighborhood as a result, so much so that on those rare occasions when a police raid was coming, the neighbors would watch out for her. and They'd run and warn her, and then down would come the shades in her haberdashery shop. The door would be locked. So um, she was considered this kind of beloved Robin Hood figure, and the neighbors took care of her. That was That's really something. To hear. One little story I would like if you could share with us. Uh, she had a warehouse. And, you know, in this warehouse, she had a gentleman who wanted to plan a robbery. What did he, how did he use that warehouse? Frederica owned uh, one or more warehouses in Brooklyn, which was then a separate city, but accessible. And her foremost 
bank burglar, a man named George Leslie, would set up the warehouses with the same furniture in the same configuration as in the bank that he was looking to burgle. And so they would be stage sets for these extended dress rehearsals and dry runs where he and the men at his command, all of whom were working for Mrs. M, would, sometimes in darkness, because the burglaries would take place by night, would learn to feel their way around this stage set without bumping into the furniture, without making any noise, and then working their way into the vault. So, indeed, her warehouses became um, uh, these kind of sound stages where bank robberies were rehearsed. Right. Remind me of a movie studio, a sound studio. Exactly. Wow. Well, eventually, eventually there's a raid and eventually things start going south for her. And even her lawyers couldn't help too much by the end, could they? Well, the new DA, a man named Peter Olney, takes office in 1884 and he makes it a mission to pursue Frederica to the end of his life, as he says. Well, he knows he can't enlist the police to do that. The police have not managed to even arrest her, much less get her indicted and tried in 25 years. Why? This is the Tammany Hall era police. Many of them, along with Tammany Paws, are on Mrs. Mandelbaum's payroll, or at minimum, they are her friends, whining and dining right next to the thieves and the uptown captains of industry at her lavish groaning table. Um, so the DA knows he cannot turn to the police, so he enlists a private firm, the Pinkerton Detective Agency, which is already famous, as one historian so rightly says, capital's muscle. They break up strikes, often violently. Uh, they work for many of the uptown robber barons who are doing things, uh, frankly, far more dangerous, far more deadly, far more nefarious than anything Mrs. M is doing. Uh, these Pastors and Vanderbilts and Rockefellers who are building their marble palaces on Fifth Avenue have won their uptown fortunes by cornering markets, making hostile takeovers, breaking strikes often with attendant fatalities, um, doing all sorts of wheeling and dealing. Yet, of course, as you say, what they're doing is considered legal. What she's doing is not. And what I hope readers of the book will take away is what's the difference really? But And so the Pinkertons are very, very important players in maintaining the fortunes of a lot of these people in so-called legitimate commerce. So the district attorney brings them in. They launch a sting operation in which they entrap Mrs. Mandelbaum. She is arrested and for the first time actually indicted. There's a, I get to reproduce the first page of her 1884 indictment papers in the book. It was thrilling to find those in the archives. And she is brought to trial. At that point, she has only two choices left to let Hal and Hummel try to work their nefarious, underhanded magic. And if that fails, and even they, with all their nefarious skill, cannot save her. Only one other terrible choice remains, and that is to flee the jurisdiction and become a fugitive. And I will leave it to readers to see which choice she makes. Very, very good. Very fascinating. Wow. I'll tell you. Very good. Uh, you know, this is just, friends, this is a great book. I have all of her books. I have all of, I have all Marguerite's books, and I love this. I absolutely love this book. And it's, as we have been showing, it takes a little part of America that we never knew about, Marguerite, and you're educating us about what life was like, what goes on. All your books are doing this, it's little bits of this, a little bit of that, and you go, wow, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. It's a, it's, it's a thrill to read your books. Well, thank you. And one of the privileges of getting to write historical nonfiction is getting to use an individual life, in this case, this astonishing lady crime boss 
as kind of a lens through which to examine larger questions of social history. And it's very clear that one of the things that allowed her to flourish, it was kind of this positive for her perfect storm that you had this eminently corrupt New York culture, the head of which was Tammany Hall and the New York police, which was equally corrupt. You had the newly emerging middle class that craved the newly mass-produced consumer goods that were flooding the market. You had suddenly quiet and portable paper money, the rise of banks. And so all of these things came together in this historical moment that allowed a poor female immigrant to become a crime boss. Who would have thought it? Who would have thought it? So what's next for Marguerite Fox? Are we writing a screenplay, a movie script? Are you writing a new book? What's happening? The screenplays I leave to the professionals. I have had the great privilege of having my last two books, Conan Doyle for the Defense and uh, The Confidence Men, optioned by film producers. And of course, um, that takes a long time. And that's even before COVID. It's even before the writer's strike. So uh, these things do not happen quickly. My screen agent is currently shopping the talented Mrs. Mandelbaum around, and a very fun parlor game is seeing um, who would play her in the movie or TV series. So um, so I'll be curious to hear what uh, your listeners might suggest. Wow, fascinating. Well, you're writing a new book. Have you started researching on that yet? I have. Uh, it's also historical nonfiction, also historical true crime, but very, very different uh, from this. This historical true crime actually takes place in the 20th century, which is unusual for me. But I guess the 20th century is itself now history. It is. It is now. It's all in the past. Well, anyway, I don't want to take up any more of your time. You have been wonderful to let us in and, and share some time with you. I thank you so very much for being with us today. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Blaine. Well, friends, I hope that has whet your appetite because this book is a five-star rating for me. Yep, this is as good as it's going to get. I loved it. I learned a lot. It's history. It's all about stuff we have forgotten about, the way things were and people who were out there. And, you know, I just really, really enjoy this. I hope you enjoyed uh, listening to Marguerite, who came to us from, live from New York City. Yeah, so we're, we're all over. Last week was Paris, this week New York City. Goodness gracious, where are we going to be next week? I'm not quite sure, but we'll get some there. Anyway, hey, listen, I don't want to take up any more of your time, but on behalf of my, my book review site, viewsonbooks.com, on behalf of my good friends at Podcast Studio X, this is Blaine DeSantis for Books and Looks, saying may all your leaves be pages in a book. Bye-bye.